and welcome to another exciting episode of The Energy That Surrounds Us. I'm your host, Michael, and I am joined today to do part two because our time was cut short and there was so much more we wanted to ask this guest, so he has graciously agreed to come back on. And so without further ado, I give you Robert Lindsay Milne. Thank you, Michael. I, I was watching the intro. It, that was spectacular. Congratulations. Thank you. My cousin does that for me. And wow. Salute. Um, yeah, and the beautiful thing about it is he's not even really into the field. He <laughs> does ads for his mom with her stuff. And sure. I said, can you make an intro? And yeah, when I saw that, I was like... Dude, this is it. You 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 nailed it. <laughs> it is it is really nice. Well, thank you. And so yes. one of the things we were talking about backstage that um, Robert and I were talking about was when you were sick this year and had taken time off that you were working on rebuilding your gift and I had mentioned about my leg and so yes. do you want to touch up and on the how you were rebuilding your git before i share my part well um or let's talk about yours first you do you have your but i'll which one would you like me to do uh you're the guest so I, I'll okay you all right so firstly i don't think of myself as gifted. Um, I, I don't think I have a gift. Uh, what what I think I have is a, a skill uh, that I committed, dedicated myself to. And I celebrate, you know, coming this coming January, January 17th, incidentally, I celebrate 59 years of being a professional psychic has been my life, my life's calling. Um, I've dedicated my life to it. Uh, um, and it's a whole part of me, but not a gift. It's, it's a talent that I've worked really hard at. I can respect that, and I can see where you're coming from. And if anybody puts as much energy into the skill, the as I put into the skill that I have, um, they would be as good or better in, in the field that they would put their energy into than, than I am. So... Um, it's it's you know it's just a question of putting the time energy. I think. No, that makes perfect sense. It's it's kind of sure. like a muscle and. Yes. So my part that I was sharing with you was, a few years ago I had broken my leg and had two metal plates and screws. How did you do that, by the way? I was on. So I was volunteering at a performing arts center and they had terrazzo flooring. Yes. And I was going down the steps and apparently I was going so fast. I missed five steps altogether and landed oh, on my leg. Wow. Yeah. And the orthopedic, when he came in and looked at it, he goes, so where was the car? Cause this is like a car accident. And I said, wow. No, it was on a stairwell. I, I was in a building, and he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so he was like, well, I'll try and put it back together. And, and he's like, I'm sure I can do it. And he goes, good thing is there's no ligament damage, no tendon damage, or muscle damage. I was like, okay, well, that's good. And then I remember as he's wheeling me back for the first surgery, he goes, I hope I can save your leg. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. How did we get to that point? Wow. But he 
finished and was like, he goes, I was able to put the joint back perfectly together. You have two metal plates and about, I think it was nine to 12 screws put in to hold it in place. And so I was having then to go into physical therapy and learn to walk. Mm -hmm. And I was discussing with you on how it was like two to three months in physical therapy. And in the beginning of the physical therapy, it's like I, I would come home crying and frustrated at no end because I'm like, it was in my late 30s, I believe, early 40s when this happened. And I'm like, I've been walking for 30, 40 years now. Why can't I walk now? And it's, and I was explaining with you that I was saying, you know, I had to realize it's not that the muscles are damaged or the bone is damaged. It's getting the muscles to release the fear that they're damaged. Oops. I am here. I just pressed the wrong button. Uh, I'll be, are you there? You're still here. Yes. Okay. I just have to, I, I accidentally pressed uh, a button on my computer. I'm please keep talking and um, I'll be right, right there. I have to put in the code. Okay. And I, so, uh, yeah. And it was frustrating to no end to sit there and be like, you know, this is something I've done every day without thinking about, and now I got to sit here and retrain the muscle to put weight on it and accept that it's fine. And it was like a major undertaking. And I finally, the week of going on a cruise to Hawaii, got cleared by physical therapy That's enough to walk with crutches and the beauty of the story is so we end up making our connection to hawaii the cruise ship had to wait for us because of delay in the flight through them that's why they waited then getting to i believe it was maui and going snuba it's snorkeling and scuba combined and to make the story short, when I held the dirt on the bottom of the ocean in the bay, I got up and realized we get back to the ship, I'm walking to dinner with no crutches, and my leg is totally fine. It's accepted everything. <laughs> and it was just a transformational moment that it was like, wow, you know, I don't know what happened. But it was like something flicked the switch, and all of a sudden it was back to normal, as normal was for me. How you doing now? Now it's every once in a while I'll feel it, like with weather, or oh, yeah. if um, I'm pushing myself too hard to sure. do something or crawling somewhere. And short spaces, it's like, nope, my leg's like, okay, that's enough of this. Stand up. <laughs> Do you think that part of, at least part of uh, that transformation was you actually manifesting it? You know, it could be because I have a habit of, like, the proverbial burning both ends sure. until it's like, and then the body, when it gets too weak, will either, I'll start to feel sick, and so I'm forced to take time. Sure. And so it could be that the body just was like, you know, we need a major break. And literally gave me a major break and caused me to stop and relook at things. Sure. I, I I I found that to be so in 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 many of the experiences I've had too. 
Yeah. So I'm curious, was yes. what brought you to becoming an award-winning baker? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I wanted to become. I wanted to be a good step dad. And um, I was involved with the woman and and um, and uh, her, her her two children, and so I got interested at first in cooking, and then I really got interested in baking. So first I learned how to bake cookies, and that was pretty good, and um, and then. I tried to make a pie and that wasn't very good. And, and uh, my partner uh, gave me a, a gift at Christmas and it was a, 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 um, a gift certificate for a, a, a baking school to go to a baking school. And I went to uh, a few classes and started to uh, bake every day. And what I did with baking was the exact same thing I, I, I do with al almost everything, and especially uh, the, the way I've developed my, my, my psychic ability. And what I did with baking is I learned the fundamentals of, of baking. Uh, I, I was really interested in pastry. And, and, and I wanted to make the best pastry that I could possibly make. So I started um, baking or making the pastry the way my grandmother did. You know, she put the flour on the table. She put the lard on the table. She put water there. And with her hands, she just put it all together and then, and then rolled the greatest pastry that you ever ever had. So I learned how to do it that way. Uh, and when I got good at baking the pastry that way, I started adding shortcuts or easier ways to do it until eventually what, what I, 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 I used um, a, uh, um, a mix master to make the, the the pastry as well and instead but in a pinch i could start right from the very fundamentals and i was good at the fundamentals and uh, that's how i've uh, done just about all of my avocations that i've had and also how i've developed my psychic ability or my you know my um uh, um, intuitive side. So did you finally figure out the key to the pies? Oh, I got really good at, at baking. And, and um, I lived in this small town just outside of Toronto. And nobody knew that I was Robert Lindsay Milne psychic in this small town. They thought I was a pastry chef. Because everywhere I went, I had my baking with me. And, and my partner, she took her, uh, you know, my baking to her patients. And, and, and the girls would, would, would take my baking to school and stuff. Everybody thought I was, I was a pastry chef. They didn't know that I was a, a psychic. Uh, and, and just b baking was, my, was an avocation that I had at, at that time. And... I also baked a lot of cakes and 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 I I like everything I I took it to an extreme the pantry that I had and and I was very proud that people could come to my house and they would uh, I would ask them to you know what kind of a cake would you like and and they would you know, come up with some bizarre, unique one that, or, or you know, people had never heard of, and and I would have the ingredients and be able to do it, and and and, and many times just from scratch. And uh, I baked every morning, 
um, before I drove to work and became a psychic. And uh, I baked every night. And and um, that that's how I got to be a good good uh, pastry chef. Or I wasn't a pastry chef, a, a good cook. And then I went into competitions and and won. And and then I I, I don't bake very much anymore. What was your favorite dish to bake? Oh, I uh, depending upon the you know the time of the year. Um, I won an award from a, it was sponsored by a, um, a vineyard and um, the, the competition was um, the best grape dessert. And, and, and I baked a um, Concord grape, pie with a rich butter crust it was absolutely spectacular i won i i i won the award for that i liked i loved that a lot um i really enjoyed you, you know looking at the fruit that i had in the house at the time and and uh putting it together you, you, you know and doing doing stuff like that I, I i liked that a lot um we have something up here in canada called butter tarts <laughs> oh man and and uh i i won a couple of awards for uh, my butter tarts uh when i was going into the fall fairs you, you know the old ladies hated me they used to uh they, they, they used to, you, you know, um, break or, or, or damage my uh, uh, exhibits because because I was uh, beating them. You know, they just they just hated me and stuff. So so <laughs> the competition uh, was it was tough competition. You know, <laughs> yeah, and you don't expect them from yeah. You know, you watch yeah. the like TV programs and sure, like everyone's nice and cordial and being like. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the opportunity to walk off, and you don't see the anger side of <laughs> right. I can't believe I lost that's right. to this person. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So um, that that was uh, one of the things that I um, as my one avocation. I've I've had many. Right. You mentioned powerlifting as well. I was. I that was that was. Um, at the same time when I was uh, going through my baking phase also. And so I'd get up in the morning and uh, bake, and then I'd uh, drive to the gym and uh, have a really heavy workout. I, um, and then I would go to the office and, you, you know, be a psychic again and then go home and, and, and bake some more. And, um, on my 49th birthday, I uh, squatted 405 pounds for six reps. Um, I leg pressed 1,000 pounds for six reps, and, and I bench, bench pressed 265. And that was the, the peak of my weight, of, of my lifting. It took, wow. me about, it took me about eight years to get there. Yeah, but that's impressive. Yes. Um, and one of the reasons that I did it was I, I come from a very abused background. And, and uh, um, I also was homeless when I was 15 years old. And, and and I I lived on the streets, surviving by my psychic ability, uh, uh, surviving by my instincts. And when I was younger, I I, I was physically abused, and and um, by people that were bigger than me. And. I, I was um, a, a pretty angry person. And um, 
I was gentle most of the time, but I was a pretty angry person for, and um, I started, I started getting re, now I had already, always been involved in physical activities. Well, well, for, there was one period I wasn't. Um, and uh, actually, uh, when I was uh, 30, when, when I was 33 years old, I had uh, reached the 300 pound mark. Um, I had gained that much weight. And by the way, I'm only about five, six and a half, five foot seven on a good, you know, tall day. Um, and so by the time I was about 33, I had reached the level of over 300 pounds. It wasn't muscle. And I changed my life and lost that weight, got more active again. And when I got into my 40s, I got very interested in, in, in powerlifting and getting strong. And as I was even, you know, and I got really serious at it. And, and you know, the, I started off having a trainer once, and once a week. And then I started the same guy twice a week and then three times a week. And then one day the trainer said uh, he was he had two weeks holidays and would I like to work out with him? And we did that two weeks. And he said, would you like to be my workout partner? You're, you, you know, you're that committed. And so uh, my trainer also, I became workout partners. And over another seven years, I had worked myself up to that level of, of strength. It was the peak. And in that time period, the sense of security I had especially when I did the lift that when I was 49, that I could walk down the street and pretty much pick up anybody and throw them. Um, and to know that I was that strong, uh, I couldn't get hurt anymore. And throughout that time that um, I was making myself really strong, I encountered a few of those people that physically hurt me and um, explained to them they couldn't anymore. That's a true I, I, I Now, now I, I never um, hurt them physically. Right. I, I just let them know I could, though. Right, and, and, and for me, yes, <laughs> and and for me that was very healing for me. And that's why I did it. Well, you know that's inspiring, and I want to go back and touch on something that you had mentioned on our prior episode. Was you know your work with the cozy team tea room? <laughs> yes. And I was curious if that work is what led to you working with the Canadian Secret Service and other agencies, or did that was there like a separation there? I started working at the Cozy Tea Room in, in Toronto. Um, I was fifteen and a half years old. I was I was homeless, and and now way before that time, like four or five years old, I was having psychic experiences, not seeing spirits, just knowing things are going to happen. Things are happening. I, just being th like that. And um, I'd always had that sense. Uh, uh, I'd and used it. At, at a young age as well. And, and actually, here's how I discovered that I um, uh, was, and I, yeah, I'd like to share this. Um, one time, this is what it was like growing up as, as a, 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 someone that had awareness or psychic ability. Um, I came home from school for lunch 
it, so I kindergarten grade one, so I'd be six, five, five years old. And so now we're in the 1950s, right? This isn't like, you know, where everybody has a cell phone. This is 1950s. Some people don't even have telephones then. I come home from school and I say to my mother, Grandma Harris died today. Well, Grandma Harris actually was my great-grandmother. And, and she lived in England. We, we lived in Toronto. I'd only ever seen her once. And like I was like, and so, I, and at this time, I was like five or six. Grandma Harris died today. My mother got angry with me for saying bad things. In fact, you, you know, yelled at me and good chance that she hit me too for saying that. News traveled slowly in those days. So the next night at dinner, my mother, father, my sister, and I at the table. My mother says to my father, Grandma Harris died yesterday. And I thought my dad was going to get angry with my mother for saying bad things. But they talked about it, though, instead. And nobody got into trouble about it. And and those kind of things were happening to me all the time. My father, when I was about nine years old, my father took me to an NHL um, uh, semifinal um, Stanley Cup hockey game. Boston and Toronto were playing. Um uh, the game was tied at the end of the third period. Um, and when the team started the first overtime period, um, when they just sort of came on the ice to stretch a bit, I knew number 17 with his Toronto Maple Leafs was going to score. I, I, I just knew it. The game hadn't started. Uh, but I knew Gary Eamon was going to score. That, that was it. So anyway, um, you know, the referee blows the whistle and the players go to the bench. Imagine this in Maple Leaf Gardens, like 18,000 people. Um, they turn the lights down while the whole building's quiet. The referee is just about to drop the puck. And I couldn't hold the energy inside anymore because not only... Not only was was uh, Gary Eamon uh, going to score, this guy wasn't even on the ice at the time. He wasn't even a first stringer. But not only was he going to score, it felt like he already had scored. So here we are, and I jump up and start screaming and cheering in this building, 18,000 people, and everybody turned and looked at me and my dad, and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, sit down. And I did, <laughs> and I did. And, and the referee drops the puck, game starts. And, and, and I was sitting there, you know, thinking, oh, like I was real, now, now I was nine. So uh, it, it's hard to, you know, put all this together right now at, at 74. Uh, so, Anyway, a um, couple of minutes later, um, Gary Eamon comes on the ice. Um, he starts skating down towards the net. A guy named Ray Kelly passes the puck to Gary Eamon. Eamon tips the puck in the net, scores the winning overtime goal, and the entire building goes crazy. Screaming, yelling, cheering. It's just unbelievable. And... I just sat there and watched and, and, you know, like the flashlights were going and people were screaming and, 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 and I just realized that I was different. And, and that's, and that's when I knew um, I, I, other people saw things, didn't see things the way I saw. And, and that's when I, 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 I uh, became aware. Now, I wasn't always as honorable. Um, so 
I, I just have to have, there's a bit of an am amendment to, to this as well. Um, and incidentally, my father to his dying day, which was just like two or three years ago, um, believed that his only son was a fraud and a charlatan. He just believed that. Um, so, and he never believed it. So <clears throat> when, when I was like, um, nine, ten years old. Um, my sister and I, we had an allowance. We used to get 25 cents a week for an allowance. And, um, that, and we would get that quarter and we would go to the Fox theater. And for a quarter, you'd get in, the, get in the movies and it'd be like two feature full lengths. And I think it was like three big cartoons and, and, uh, a serial movie as well. Box of popcorn, a big drink of, of, uh, I think Americans call it soda. We call it pop here. And, and they also, and, 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 and a bag of candy, like, so the night that Eamon scored was a Thursday and the next game was the sa Saturday. And that was when we got our allowance. And on Saturday morning, when Gail and I went to my father to get our allowance, I said to my dad, Boston's going to win tonight. And my dad said, no. And I said, I bet you a quarter. That's my allowance, right? I said, I right. bet you a quarter that they do. And uh, he took the bet. Boston won that night, and I doubled my allowance. And I hustled my dad for several years <laughs> with that. I, I got so good at it, I had to let him win sometimes. I thought I was going to get caught. So... Um, that was that was um, what what I thought about uh, in, in terms of psychic things when I was five or eight or ten or, and it was also how I learned to survive when I was on the street, um, learning how to use my skills or abilities on how to survive. No, that makes perfect sense. I mean, mm -hmm. I imagine anyone in that position would do the same thing. Now, I never, ever, when I was homeless, you know, living in an alleyway and stuff. Well, I didn't live in an alleyway. I was too smart. Um, but but when when I, I, I was uh, homeless in, in, in the wintertime, um, I was... When, when I was always um, taken care of or knew how to take care of myself. And when I was in trouble, I was always offered the opportunity to solve a problem using my psychic intuitive instincts or abilities or an illegal or an immoral an immoral way of solving it. Um, I almost always chose the psychic or the intuitive way. I never solved it in an illegal way. I, I did on, on occasion solve it in an immoral way. Um, Sometimes children have to do things to stay alive. Um, but I never, ever stole anything or used my um, psychic ability in a, a way that would uh, dishonor it. And, and, and I always, even, even as a kid, after, after I realized what I could do, or what I was doing, I, I always had, have had a, a respect for the, the awareness right, like that. Right, and that makes sense. And yeah. I like Flix Love's comment. He says, I love how Robert speaks with so much love about it all. Inspirational. And he says, passion for life. That's it. Well, um... You know, 
I, I, I've been, I, I've done this by my calling. Uh, you, you know, I was, I keep saying it, like I was 15 and a half years old when I started at the tea room. And, and, um, I, I, and I've been doing this now for 59 years and, and I've been around the world. I was the first Canadian psychic to, uh, um, appear and do call in psychic shows on radio and TV. I was the first Canadian to tour across Canada and, um, and then into, um, the U S and then in all, all, in all other, almost all of the other, uh, English speaking countries. Um, it's been what it's been, uh, it's been what I was, what I chose to make my life be. Um, the reason I was hesitating is because, you know, I could have done other things as well, but no, I could have done other things, uh, as a poet, but I chose this and when I contacted the cozy tea room, it was, you know, it was a cold January day, um, and I, I heard that if you worked at the Cozy Tea Room and doing tea leaf and card readings, uh, um, if you worked there in the afternoon, first of all, you'd get a sandwich, a cup of tea and cookies, and then you would get to do some tea leaf and card readings and get paid at the end of the shift. And if you worked there in the evening, you got a hot dinner cup of tea and cookies and you got paid at the end of the night so i phoned um i went down to the cozy tea and by the way it was a dump uh, i i went down to the cozy tea room and i applied so how do you you know how do you apply to get a job as a, well you do uh, a, a reading for the owner of the tea room and um you had to do tea leaf for i had never done a tea leaf reading in my life. I had never really heard of doing tea leaf readings. Um, and I had to, do, so what I did is I, you know, there was a teacup and there were tea leaves in the bottom of the cup. And, and I held the cup in front of my, you know, like this. And, and I put it between my eye, in my eyes. And, and, and I was looking at Mrs. Cox, that's what Mrs. Cox was the owner. And, and I held the, tea, the teacup in my hands and looked at Mrs. Cox and I pretended I was looking at the tea leaves. And then I just used my psychic ability and told her about her and did my, you know, 15 year old, you know, shtick as, as a psychic. And then I had to do a card reading. Um, I had never done a card reading. We didn't even have cards in the house I'd lived in. So, so um, I, I just looked at the cards, um, handed them to her, and I said, shuffle the cards, because I didn't know. So she shuffled the cards, and he put them down on the table, and and um, I just put some down on the table. And uh, I pointed to a card, and then just looked at her and did my psych psychic thing with her again. And I was pointing to the cards and you know making it as if I was you know, doing a card reading. And I was just using my psychic instincts. And I got the job that day. I love how you were able to emulate exactly something you have never seen or done. And that everybody was like, oh, he's really doing it. <laughs> he was really doing it. And, and, and the, the, um, the tools that others used, I didn't. So the uh, I I was using my pure abilities, and and in order to survive, I had to pretend I was doing it the way they did in the tea room, rather than doing it the way I do it. Right, and 
that's what I mean. It was yeah that you were able to make it look like you were doing a card reading, even yes. though you had never done a card reading, but you yeah. knew how to make it look like. Yeah. And I think that's survival. Brilliant. You had yeah. that. <laughs> uh, well, um, my family on, on my mother's side um, were horse traders, uh, horse dealers. Um, and, and, um, used car sales people and, and what, and I believe there is a, a little bit of gypsy blood in our, in our background. And, and, um, I, you know, this is a joke. Uh, I, I have, it's, it's a curse sometimes. It's like, I have the blood of a gypsy running through my veins. Um, and the curse is I can see where the um, scams can be. The curse is I have a conscience and can't do it. So I see it. I see, I can see all the scores, but I, 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 I just can't do it because it goes against my, my moral values. And, and, you know, I have cousins that drive, you know, drove around in, you know, Ferraris and, you know, lived in mansions and, and um, they, they didn't have the, the uh, uh, conscience side that, that I have. So it's, it was like a, a, a curse and a, and a blessing at the, at the same time. Um, so what it really was is my ability to, to survive to do what I needed to do. And that's how I go about doing psychic readings, by the way. And the way I go about psychic readings is I don't care how I get the answer. What I'm interested in is getting the answer. And, and it doesn't matter how I do it. Uh, so if I were... Uh, uh, taking a math exam, and um, I looked at the math, you know, and I or the the, the uh, exam, and just put all the answers on the page, and then turned it in. You, you know, the professor wouldn't pass me uh, because you need in a math exam, you need to show them how, why you get the answer that you do. In my job you get the points for getting the answer. So I don't put labels on them. I don't put, um, I, I don't say uh, I'm clairvoyant or clairsentient or an empath. I look for the answer. And what I often teach my students is become aware of what's obvious. And when you become aware of what's obvious, then more becomes obvious. And when you become aware that's more obvious, then you become, you get to a point where what's obvious to you is not obvious to others. And, and that's the first stages of developing and expanding one's psychic ability. And um, so instead of worrying about whether you're remote viewing or whether you're being a telepath, just give them the bloody answer. Just, just get to the point. And, and that's how I've always done it. So often, I, well, I've been involved with finding lost people. Um, most of them were dead. Um, I, for a couple of years work with um, the, the RCMP security service. I had direct contact with a, a, a KGB uh, um, agent. Uh, um, um, I, I was instrumental in interfering with and breaking up a an intelligence ring between Cuba, Canada, and Germany. 
and and um, psychically, I I I um, exposed that. Uh, um, what was that like going through all of that to expose? It was like doing a psychic reading. It was it was like um, it was um. Well, it was it was fun, but it was what I was meant to do, and um, it's been it was the way my life has been, and. I've taken my awareness, pushed it to my limit or its limit. Well, maybe I haven't, uh, maybe I could do more, but, but uh, what I thought it was my limit. Um, I, I, can I just go back a little bit? Maybe I can explain it in. Okay. So, um, so I left, I, I was at the tea room for six years. And in that time, I, I worked every day, five days a week, sometimes six days a week. And then sometimes I would uh, do private parties uh, on Sundays. That, that's how much I did readings. Um, when I was 21, I heard that when a young man uh, um, becomes a priest, they make a vow that they will do a site, uh, that they would say a, a, a mass every day of their life. I decided that this would be my calling. Therefore, I would either do a psychic reading or practice being psychic every day of my life. And, and, and I managed to either do a psychic reading or practice every day um, for very close to 32 years without missing a day of, of, of that. Um, it's been that kind of commitment. Um, when I left the tea room at around 21, I was living in a flea bag hotel, barely making a living. And um, I th was thinking about what can I do to bring client customers in or people to get readings from me? What could I do? And now, now remember, this is like in the 1970s, different, you know, different world. And, and incidentally, the hotel I was living at had one of those old fashioned phones where you pick it up and, you know, the operator dials it for you. Uh, anyway, I was thinking, could I do readings on the telephone? Nobody had done that, by the way. So I started calling my friends, practicing doing psychic readings on the telephone. And um, I did that for several months every day. And then I got my friends to give me fr their friends' names um, and the friends knew I was going to call. And I would, again, practice doing psychic readings. And then I just spread my name around uh, saying, if you want to have a psychic reading, call me at, um, you, you know, Larry's Hideaway Hotel. That was where I was saying, Larry's Hideaway Hotel. Um, and uh, call me. And so, you know, like three o'clock in the morning, the phone would ring, hey, this is Joe, what can you tell me? And, you know, I'd be asleep and, you know, wake up and go from asleep to awake and do some readings and then go back to sleep again. And it was, it was like that. And then one day I said, how are you going to get paid? And I thought, oh, uh, hmm. And... Now, this was back, this again, this, we're in early 70s, and people didn't have credit cards. Like, credit cards? Like, what? They just weren't around. Um, and nobody would have given me one in those days or let me be, a, 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 you know, a visa merchant. So I thought, if I can do readings on the telephone, could I do readings on the telephone on the radio? And I thought, 
only one way to find out. So there's this small city outside of Toronto in the north. Are, are we running out of time by any chance, Michael? Or I notice you're a bit impatient. Oh, no, I'm enjoying oh. listening to the story. Oh. Okay, so remember, I was about 24, 25 maybe, maybe a bit younger. Anyway, so there was a small town, a small city just outside of uh, Toronto uh, called Aurelia, and a friend of mine lived there. Uh, actually, a lot of you know people from that city, small city, went on to become, become you know, like famous um, actors or or politicians or. Anyway, a um, friend of mine lived there, and I asked her if there was a radio station in the town, and, and she told me there was, and, um, and, the, and the radio station was, um, it, it'll kind of be sorry. Um, anyway, it was a, I can't remember the call letters. And anyway, um, it was this little rinky-dink radio station, um, and um, the morning man, the talk show host, and the program director was the same guy, and his name was Rusty Draper, and um, he was a kind of like a bulldogish kind of guy, you know, kind of curt and short to the temper, you know, short to the point and direct. And I phoned him and said, you know, my name is, um, I, by, in those days, I called myself Bob Milne. And, and just at this point, um, I, I said, you know, this is Robert, by the way, Robert Lindsay Milne is my name. And I said to the guy, you know, my name is Robert Lindsay Milne. And, you know, I can come on your radio show and um, your callers can call in and I can do psychic greetings. And um, he said to me, if you can do what you say you can do, you're on my show tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. No, sorry, not 10 after nine. And if you can't do what you say you can do, you're off my show at 20 after nine. Other than that, come on up. If you're okay with that, come on up. And I said, okay. And now the radio show, this radio station, they would they usually broadcast from there, except their talk show was broadcast from um, um, a, a hotel. And I'm just trying again, it was a chain of hotels. Um, and it was it was broadcast from the the um, dining room because this restaurant or the di the hotel was having trouble getting customers to come to the uh, uh, dining room to have food. So they started broadcasting the talk show live from the uh, dining room. So the day before, it was Howard Johnson's, by the way. Um, the day before, I, I spoke to Rusty. Um, and he said, you know, come on up and you're on my show tomorrow morning. I, I didn't have any money. I, I no, I mean like when I said I didn't have any money, like like zero, like nothing. And um Aurelia is about a hundred miles north of Toronto. And um I I hitchhiked to Aurelia and um there's a lake that uh, Aurelia is on in this Lake Kuchichin. And I slept in the park that night. And the next morning I swam in the lake, Lake Kuchichin for my bath. Um, and I then got dried off and, and, and went down to the Holiday Inn. Um, to be on the radio and find out if I could do phone calls and be psychic. And and um, so I, I must have looked a little scruffy, you, you know, but uh, at first, you know, the, you know, when I got there, you know, they were wondering, who's this guy? And I said, you know, I was with uh, Rusty Draper uh, in the show. Um, 
when I found the dining room, uh, I just saw them setting up the, the you, you know, the uh, broadcast. And there was nobody in the restaurant other than that. And and we, we uh, go on the air. And Rusty says to me, um, so if you're so darn psychic, I don't know if you if you're so darn psychic, what can you tell me about me? And I said to him, I'm thinking of someone's name, Richards or Richard's son, and he has red hair in a briefcase. And Rusty looked at me and he said, nobody knows that. And and um, he just changed the subject, and then he said, "Can you do, you know, can you do calls?" And like, oh, sure. And and we started doing calls. And about twenty minutes into the show, people now again, this like this had never been done in Canada. Like we didn't know about these things. I had never done this in before. <laughs> And and people started coming into um, the uh, hotel, and um, they came up to the microphone and asked questions and stuff. And by about quarter to ten, the place was packed. And and um, I saw Rusty talking to a guy off, you know, during a, a commercial break, and he came back and said, "Can you stay another hour?" And, and I said, oh, sure, um, I, I can. So, because I was only supposed to be on between nine and 10. So then we get, then by about quarter after 10, there's a lineup outside the restaurant. And then, then, then you know, the place is completely packed and, and everybody's buying food and, and drinking and, and, it's, and uh, coming up to the microphone and, and calling in. And then I see they're having another conversation at about quarter to 11. And then Musty says, can you stay till, um, can you stay to 11? I say, sure. And we, we go on. And um, now they clear the room because there were just so many people out in the hallway. And they fill the room again. And, um, this, this now, and, and everything was like, it was like a blur for me. And, uh, you know, it's starting to run out of gas. And, and at about 20 to 12, I, I, I said to Rusty, I, 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 I can't go on anymore. I, I, I'm done. And at the end of the show, I, I stood up and all of a sudden I got completely swarmed. And, and, you know, my brain was full or, or empty from all that had gone on. Um, I was really tired, and all these people were surrounding me um, and, and were, yeah, I understand. That was the way it was feeling, only there were a lot more of them going. And, and um, you know, everybody was screaming and asking questions, and, and I just could, you know, I was just overwhelmed. And all of a sudden, like two guys, one guy grabs one arm and one guy grabs the other and, and they pull me away and, and down where the offices are. And one was Rusty and the other one was the owner of, of um, Howard Johnson's hotel. And we get in the office and and like like and, and you know, this was like a blur at this time for me. And um, Rusty says, um, could you stay over uh, another, you know, tonight and beyond tomorrow? And, and, and I said, uh, um, I'm, I, 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 I can't, I, I have to be honest. I hitchhiked up here and I swam in the lake, slept in the park last night and I'm tired and I haven't eaten since yesterday. And I just want to go home. I'm hungry and I just want to go home. The guy that owned Howard Johnson said, oh, well, we can take care of that. 
And I said, oh, okay. And, and um, Rusty said, can you, do you do readings? Um, and, you know, back in Toronto, and I said, oh, yeah, sure. And in those days, I was charging five bucks a reading, right? And, and um, so Rusty says, well, if you can stay over and be on the show tomorrow, um, we could get one of the girls, you know, one of the girls, right, at, at, the, at the radio station, they could book appointments for you. And I said, oh, great. And Rusty said, how much do you charge? And I said, $25. And he said, oh, you're never going to get that here. And, and I said, uh, I don't care. Because I was going to be sleeping at Howard Johnson's. And, and the owner had already said, if I stay and, and do readings, I could stay there as long as I want. And, and um, I was a guest at the hotel. Like, you know, I was there um, free. So anyway, the next day we did the show and they booked 125 readings. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. At 25 bucks a reading. And, um, and I had no expenses and, um, I, what when anyway when when I started doing the I was there about ten days, and and the money just started coming in, and more and more and more, and I started thinking to myself, how am I going to get home? Because because you know I'm not going to be hitchhiking, and I thought oh I could take the bus. And then another day later, now remember, I was like 24 or something. Um, another day, another day or two later, I was, well, okay, you could, you could, you could take the train. Was, okay. Then another day it was, well, you could take a cab. And I said, yeah, I could do that. And each day that wide in my pocket just kept getting bigger and bigger. And, and, um, about two days before, the, you know, the it was about the eighth day, I thought, I wonder if I could fly home. So I phoned the Aurelia Airport. They, they didn't have a, uh, a big airport, and Air Canada wasn't landing there. And um, But the guy said that they had charter flights, uh, Cessnas, to downtown Toronto at, at, at Toronto Island Airport. And and um, he said that would be a hundred dollars. So that was just doing four readings. And so uh, the way I got home was I I flew back in a in in a single engine Cessna in a, a charter, and I took a cab to my place. It was a dive, and um, the next day, I, I um, went out and got a newspaper and. I, I went to a restaurant and sat down and I went through the want ads and uh, um, I, I looked at um, um, apartment, furnished apartments for rent. And I took a cab to um, one apartment building and I went in and it was a one bedroom apartment and, and it was furnished. And, and I paid six months rent in advance. And I went back to the, the dive I was staying at and put everything I had could get in the cab in, 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 from the apartment and took it to my new place. And um, that's, that's how I became a performing psychic because I started calling radio stations and telling them what I did with uh, Rusty. And that's how I started doing that. No, that's an amazing story, and what a gift that the hotel and radio station, you know, challenged you in such a way of going, you know, one, like Rusty saying, you're not going to get that, and then you just... I didn't care. Wrong, and 
The hotel was like, well, hey, well to help you. being honest, it wasn't so much proving him wrong. You know, Howard Johnson was, Johnson was like being in a palace compared to the dive I was living in. So, right. okay, so all right, if I'm not going to get it, I'm still going to, I don't have to pay tonight or tomorrow. I don't care then if I'm not going right. to get and it. And I didn't mean proving them wrong. I just meant yeah. that life itself proved it wrong and you got sure. Sure. more than what they were anticipating. <laughs> yes, we all did. I was talking to, now that was um, more than 50 years ago. And I, I, w I was talking with Rusty about five years ago. I said, hello. He remembered me. Oh, I'm sure that would be hard to forget. <laughs> Somebody just walking in and having yeah, 125. <laughs> Yeah, and and filling the hotel, yeah. the the restaurant. It was it was it was um, it it was an amazing experience. I, I I've had a lot of amazing experiences, uh, and, and incidentally, both ways. You know, I've had you know those glorious ones. I've I, I've had the odd crash or two as well. So how do you recover from the crash? Do you just tell yourself, hey, it was just a bad day, tomorrow will be different? Or, you know, what, just, what do you do for up, yourself? Get up and do it. Um, at this age, so, you know, 74, um, what I've seen in life and, and how I see it now is, is quite different than, say, 50 years ago. How I see life, the purpose of life is to experience. And that's it. So the purpose of life is to experience all things and all levels. And we have free choice and free will to experience anything we want. There's a couple of clauses that go with that, though. We have free choice and free will to experience anything, what we want. H however, um, what we do one way, we must and will do equally the opposite. So, Whatever you do this way, you will do the opposite. And then the other uh, um, rule is on this planet, in this solar system, in this galaxy that, that we're in, um, we're accountable. So we're accountable for our behavior, but we can do it if we want anything. So... If you see life like that, what we do one way, we do equally the opposite. That and and the purpose of life is to experience. Then you can't ruin your life because you're here to experience, and what you do one way, you're going to do the opposite, and. Because you're experiencing, you can't ruin it. You can make it different, but you can't ruin it because you're here to experience. And you will do the opposite. And incidentally, often uh, everywhere in between as well. That also means you can't fail because that's the experience too, right? So you're here right. for that experience. Right. So, and here's another one is... What we are one way, we are also the opposite. As good as we are, as bad as we are. As determined as we are, as lazy as we are. As accomplished that we can be, 
as much a failure we can be. We already are both sides. So the purpose also is to be balanced. So you can't fail. You can't ruin your life. And you can always make it different. That's what I think. And you just blew me away with that because I was like, that is the most beautiful, insightful, inspirational way I have ever really heard that put. And it makes total sense. And it's like your mind, there's like no way you can trap your mind in getting into that trap of, oh, you know, I failed at this, so maybe I should leave this. It's no, there's, it's built into it. So it's like, okay. So today was a bad day. Brush it off. Tomorrow will be better or could be the same. It is what it is. Some of the greatest lessons have been the result of me falling on my ass. Some of the greatest lessons uh, I've learned was when I got beat up, not necessarily physically, but yeah, even that. So, so, some of the greatest lessons I've learned is, is um, in failure. One, one of my teachers had a saying, an expression, um, the greatest barrier to personal growth is uninterrupted success. So the greatest barrier to personal growth is uninterrupted success because after a while you stop working at it right you, you start you, to ride you, your coattails so to speak absolutely now, you know that's when the champion gets knocked out you know eight nine ten you know that's when it happens um and uh i'm thinking some times uh well you do that it reminds me of the quote from the movie um batman begins oh yeah where oh, yeah, dad yeah. picks him up when he falls down the well and he says why do we fall so we learn to get back up uh, yes so here's another way that i say yeah you know um what we are one way we must we are equally the opposite and balance is the key to power. And then I say, uh, you know, we have to be, there has to be two sides of us. Have you ever seen a one-sided line? You can't have a one-sided line. So if you are this side, you have to be on the, you have to have another side. But here's another thing. No matter how small that line is, there are two sides in the middle. It's always like that, too. Wow, that's beautiful. And I just realized we're at an hour and 16 minutes, so I apologize. We ran over the hour. But, man, I'm like, I am so struck by that that it's like my mind is like i can't think of a question or a comment to go with it it's like my mind is like this is the perfect way to end this because that is just so insightful and so i think necessary that everyone i hope hears that and understands what is being said and resonates with them because that, that is a truly powerful statement and insight to have. It's very simple. And they always say the, the best things in life are the simplest, and we always like to make them harder. And... Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to thank you for coming on and you know, indulging me with some more of these questions and 
I hope that you had fun on this episode. Yes, I did. It, was, it is fun. I, I did have fun. Did, did, didn't, don't I look like I was having fun? <laughs> I was having a lot of fun. And I, I just, there are moments that it's like, I, I rarely get awestruck by what people say, but you, I have to say, got me truly awestruck a couple of times to where I was like, my mind had to finish processing what you were saying and catch up because it was like, wow, it was just stuff I needed to hear. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you, Michael. Um, um, I'm, I'm touched. Thank you. Um, it's, it's simple stuff. Um, I, 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 you know, that's, you know, I do a lot of thinking in, in, in those areas. You know, I think about that stuff a lot. Um, you could have them back another time. I talk, think, you know, talk about other things too. I'd love to have you back on again. And um, that would be such a blessing. And I want to thank everyone in the chat room and who was commenting or, um, we did have one question. I didn't bring it up because we were in the stories and it was someone was asking questions for a reading. And I simply commented into the chat room, if you want a reading to contact you directly, that's the best yes. way to do that. Yes. Oh, are you? Is this when I give out my um, contact info? Is that is that the lead? Is that what yes. you? Oh, okay. So Robert Lindsay Milne, you can find me on uh, my website uh, www.robertlindsaymilne.com. Uh, you can also find me on um, Apple, um, Spotify, iHeart. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Messenger, but www.robertlindsaymilne.com is probably the easiest way. And, and uh, give me a call. Yeah, and do you want to give a quick shout out to your podcast show? Oh, yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, I also have my own podcast, which is called My Side of the Crystal Ball. And um, it's, it's uh, doing pretty good. And there is at least one in every episode I talk about, well, like I did a little talk with, 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 with you tonight, Michael, and, and that's called WWRS. What would Robert say for that segment? And then we have a, uh, an expert in um, just about any, every field around. Um, and, and we talk about really interesting and uh, evolved things. So uh, my side of the crystal ball. And you can find it anywhere you listen to or see your podcasts. Thank you for that. And I highly recommend checking it out. And thank you again for coming on. And to all of our fans out there, have a blessed day, blessed afternoon, blessed evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for watching, as always. And have a great weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. You have just listened to the energy that surrounds us with your host, Michael Koff. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.